Thank you very much for those kind words and for reminding me of my time in prison. <laughs> which, uh, um, I've never been as irritable as I was in prison, but there was a tremendous amount that one could do in the prison that wasn't being done. There was a tremendous amount that needed to be done. And dementia, for me, has the same attraction. Uh, it is the fact that it ain't right at the moment. It is the fact that there's so much that we can do that we're not doing. And that's what I'd like to talk about in the next 50 minutes. Thank you very much for coming, all of you. It's a, it's a very scary uh, audience, by the way. <laughs> No, honestly, you are very scary, especially you over there. <laughs> it's a very scary audience because you're, you're a mixture, you're a mixture of people. If it's just academics, I can talk to them. If it's just clinicians, I can talk to clinicians. Public, I love talking to the public. We put them all together. And that's really difficult. I asked for advice. And I was told that I should have a good joke at the beginning. <laughs> so I wore this suit. <laughs> <laughs> How could there possibly be reasons to be cheerful about dementia? Dementia is a devastating set of illnesses. It has profound negative impacts on the people affected. Patients with dementia, it's a progressive neurodegenerative disorder which causes individuals to <coughs> stop being able to do things to do with thinking, with language, with reasoning, with planning. It interferes with people's activities of daily living. It stops people from being able to eat and care for themselves and dress. It interferes <coughs> with people's psychological and behavioral function as well. So people get depression and psychosis. Awful things happen to people with dementia. And the families of people with dementia <coughs> also have you know, complicated, severe, enduring needs that are caused by that dementia. So what possible reason could there be for being cheerful about dementia? Well, let me take you on a journey. A journey back through time. A journey through the time tunnel back to 1979. But let's think of 1979. 1979. 25 years ago. What was it like in 1979? Ian Drury was able to find all of those things to be cheerful about in 1979. So was 1979 a particularly exciting, particularly happy, particularly wonderful year? Let's take a look. So, <laughs> the winter of discontent. We had uh, strikes of the bin men across England. There were strikes of grave diggers in Liverpool, so that warehouses were full of coffins. There was terrorism on the streets of London. Here we see Airy Neve's car being blown up by the INLA at the Houses of Parliament, right at the centre of government, terrorism. Sid Vicious died. <laughs> he died at the Chelsea Hotel of an overdose of, of heroin uh, while he was on remand for the murder of his girlfriend, Nancy Spungen. Um, it was a Scottish referendum. <laughs> <laughs> Some things don't change. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but it wasn't all bad. <laughs> the largest shopping centre in Europe opened at Milton Keynes. Reasons to be cheerful. The best book ever written was published. Now, this is really exciting. This is the best thing that happened in 1979. We discovered a new plant in England. There's only about six plants that have been discovered in England in this century. That is a hybrid ragwort that was found in a car park in York. That's what happened in 1979. But also this happened in 1979. The Alzheimer's Disease Society was founded in 1979. Before then, there was no voice for people with dementia and their carers. That's when it started. If we look back in time, and we look back at what it was like then, 25 years ago, we really didn't know much about dementia. And what we knew was generally wrong. So, reasons to be cheerful, part one. We know a lot more about dementia. This is the number of papers published on Alzheimer's disease by decade. 
In the decade of the 1970s, in the whole of that decade, we had 290 papers on Alzheimer's disease. That, in academic terms, is a small amount. Yes? <laughs> That's about as close as we're going to get to statistics, by the way, in the whole of this uh, talk. As you see, it's, uh, it's increased. So in the 2000s, we're up to something like 4,000 papers. And in our decade, there have already been that many publications on Alzheimer's disease. We know more. And what we know is more likely to be true. We know stuff about the impact that dementia has on people with dementia. We know what problems it causes. We're much better at delineating between the different forms of dementia. We have a better idea of what the outcomes are for people with dementia. We have an increasing understanding not only of the causes of dementia, but potentially of treatments and working towards cures for dementia, but also in terms of how we provide better quality care for people with dementia. All that has changed. We know the burden of the illness. We know that there are 36 million people in the world with dementia now. And that, again, to use a technical term, or the same technical term, is a lot. There are a lot of people with dementia in the world, and the numbers will increase. With that driven by one thing and one thing only, which is population ageing. The world is getting older, and that is brilliant. That is fantastic. Because that means that we have dealt with many of the problems that kill people in childhood, that kill people in middle age. We've done brilliant and remarkable things in the developed world with heart disease, with strokes, with cancer. In the developing world, we're starting to do wonderful things again with infectious diseases. And that is why the population is ageing. That is why by 2050 and 25 years from now, there will be over 100 million people with dementia in the world. And we know that there will be over 100 million people with dementia. Because those people who will develop it in 25 years' time already have the pathology in their brains, already have the processes starting. Because dementia, the neurodegenerative disease, starts many years before we're able clinically to diagnose those individuals. So this is a product of our success. This is a product of demographic change. The numbers are gigantic. For the UK, we're looking at 800,000 people with dementia, with that increasing by 2051 to 1.7 million people. But each one of those people is a person with dementia affected by this awful illness. It's a family affected by this awful illness. And you know, there are individual stories of transcendent you know, um, uh, coping under awful pressure. There are people solving problems every day. And this slide from the Alzheimer's Society, I think, very helpfully reminds us not only of the numbers, uh, but of the people behind those numbers. And we here in Sussex, we are national leaders in dementia. We have more old people than anywhere else in terms of regions in the country. And that means we have more people with dementia per head. <coughs> and that's great for us, because that gives us a mission. There's a good reason why we here in Sussex, why we here in this medical school, why we here in the Trust, in the Sussex Partnership Trust, should be particularly interested in making Sussex a great place for people with dementia to live. And we know that dementia is costly. We know that there are the costs, obviously, to people with dementia themselves, and the costs that accrue to families. But the financial cost of dementia is remarkable. Dementia costs the world $600 billion per year. <coughs> now, that's a very great deal indeed. That's more than a lot. If dementia were a, country, uh, were a company, it would be the largest company by turnover in the world. Bigger than Walmart, bigger than ExxonMobil. If it were a country, it would be the world's 18th largest country. I mean, that is remarkable in health terms. This is a gigantic problem for the world. So if dementia were a country, it would be at the G20. <laughs> and one of the things it would be deciding at, at the next G20 meeting is whether to make dementia a priority, which was interesting, isn't it? Dementia in the UK costs more than cancer and heart disease put together. Does dementia attract more policy attention 
than cancer and heart disease put together? Does it attract more research funding than cancer and heart disease put together? Does it attract more service funding than uh, dementia and cancer, than cancer and heart disease put together? And the answer is no, it doesn't. But it's changing, again. Things are changing. Not only are we increasing our knowledge in terms of uh, things that are about dementia, we're getting increasing understanding of the things that we need to do as countries to deal with dementia. And here we have uh, the National Dementia Strategy, which was generated in 2009, uh, which sets out the problems and which sets out the start of thinking about how we might deal with those problems. Notice that Japan was one of the countries that had developed a national dementia strategy. Japan, Japan is the oldest country in the world. It has more people who are old and therefore more people with dementia than you are. So Japan is essentially the world's Sussex. <laughs> but there was a problem in Japan. There was a problem in Japan because actually you know, this is a country with high degrees of filial piety, respect for older people. They really do respect older people. Dementia is a disease of older people. And yet dementia care really wasn't very good. In fact, dementia care was very bad. They had the highest levels of physical restraint of any country in the developed world, people with dementia. That's tying people with dementia to beds to treat their physical uh, problems and their psychological problems. And what was the reason for this? Well, one of the reasons was that the word for dementia <coughs> Chiho, uh, Japanese words are made up of these sort of pictograms, these, these, these concepts. Essentially, this was one that combined the concepts of idiocy and stupidity. Okay. So that made it very difficult for a respectful young Japanese politician to stand up and say the word dementia even. Because you couldn't say the word dementia because it was in fact swearing about old people, which is a bad thing to do, so no one talked about it. And what happens when people don't talk about stuff? Bad stuff happens when people talk about stuff. And what happens when they change the name to ninchitsu, which is a combination, it's a, a neutral word meaning cognitive disorder. Well, within a year and a half of this change, they had uh, recruited three million people across Japan to be dementia friends, to actually start acting for people with dementia. And it has changed gigantically in Japan. In Japan, uh, they've just published their orange plan. That's their national dementia strategy. And their orange plan includes the establishment of 4,000 memory services across Japan in order to deliver early diagnosis and good quality care. These are remarkable changes in Japan. So what about our national dementia strategy? This is a, a, a summary of it. And I only put this slide up to make you go, ooh, that's a bit complicated. Because actually it is a bit complicated. And if you're looking for reasons why we've not already done this, it's because it's complicated. We've done the simple stuff, you know, the cancers, the heart disease, all that stuff. <laughs> We're left with the difficult things, the things that transcend the boundaries of health and social care, of physical and mental disorder, of what families should do, of what the state should do, of what industry should do. <laughs> Dementia is a brilliant exemplar of the complexity that is the reality of what the challenges are for health services of all sorts, for acute hospitals. Uh, for accident and emergency departments, for general practice, uh, as well as for mental health services. Dementia is, the, is, I think, the prime exemplar of that across the world. And this just shows that it is helpful to look at what the problems are, to chunk them up, because that's the way you start to do something about them. And here we have a whole set of things that have flown out of the, uh, flowed out of the National Dementia Strategy. These are things that are government initiatives that are starting to operationalise, that are starting to change the way that services are provided, that are starting to improve the quality of care. And it's not just our country. Here's uh, a World Health Organisation report that we, were also, that we were also involved in uh, helping put together. And this says that at a world level, for developing as well as developed countries, we need to see dementia as a priority. In the developing world, it's fascinating because... You know, in, in, in India, in China, uh, there is a vast increase. We have a doubling of people with dementia. There will be two, three, four times the numbers of people with dementia just in the next 20 years in those countries. And the ideas 
the manners of social construction that enabled society, the society to be able to deal with people with dementia in years gone by are breaking to pieces in a single generation. So, for example, in China, we have an unforeseen consequence of the one-child policy, whereby there is a whole generation of carers for people with dementia who aren't there. Who are going to care for those people? One of the reasons why China hoards dollars is because it's so worried about long-term care. It has macroeconomic implications. India, you know, it, as, as it industrialises, you know, as people move from villages to towns, towns to cities, cities to you know, all over the world, a diaspora, and the people aren't there to look after their own. What will the world do for <coughs> dementia? Uh, we have our own Prime Minister's challenge here. Our Prime Minister has, has been extraordinarily strong. One of the brilliant things about the way the National Dementia Strategy has worked is that we've had um, politicians and parties vying for who will do most, not who will do least. And that's great, because that's what people with dementia need. So we're starting from a very low base. And here we have a picture from the G8 summit <coughs> held in December of last year, whereby it was seen as the priority, the health priority, for the G8 to deal with. The G20 will make the same decision as well. This is you know, a remarkable change. If you're looking for whether things have got better, things have changed since 1979 with respect to dementia. We're starting to understand the things that get in the way. This false belief that, belief that dementia is a normal part of aging, it's just not. It's associated with age but it is not a normal part of ageing. We should not use that as an excuse for not providing services, for not helping people to understand what's going on. This false belief that nothing can be done, that just because we don't have a magic bullet that will make dementia go away, that it's not health, it's something else. It's just nonsense, isn't it? Because the diseases that we are now faced with are all ones which are about the long-term management of conditions. We've done the simple stuff. We can do that. This is the stuff that we're left with. This is the complexity. And it's a false belief that nothing could be done because simple things, just four sessions of good quality information given to people with, de with dementia at diagnosis and given to the carers of those people have been shown to reduce institutionalisation by 28%. That's a gigantic impact for a tiny outlay. That's reducing the median length of stay in institutional care by 558 days. A tiny investment for a gigantic benefit, but one that accrues seven years down the line. One that accrues to social services from a healthcare intervention. So our systems don't make that easy. And of course, addressing the stigma of dementia. Uh, and we can do this. We can change public attitudes and understanding because we're good at it. We have health promotion budgets. We know how health education works. And this campaign here was one of the highest rated campaigns of any advertising campaign in the last decade. The Alzheimer's Society is worried about your memory campaign. Many people suffer from memory, memory loss as they get older, but if it starts to happen on a regular basis, it could be the early signs of dementia. If you're worried, see your doctor. A message to the public, a message to professionals, allowing people to come forward. And, you know, and there's the immense hunger for good quality data. You know, the, the reason why the Daily Mail, it, well, when it's not talking about Harriet Harman, that is, when the Daily Mail every week has a story about <coughs> dementia, you know, it's, a, it's spinach cures dementia one day, and then it's curry causes dementia another day. <laughs> and then the next day, if you have some coffee, you'll get it, or it'll cure you. And you read the things, it's all about some mouse in California uh, who's been uh, experimented on. And the reason those things get onto the front page is because people really want information, and we can give it to people. So what can we do here? Our first reason to be cheerful. Well, here we have the HEX, that's the Health Education Kent, Surrey and Sussex. The people who purchase medical education and nursing education and education for all other healthcare professionals. The Time Enough Dementia Programme. This is about changing professional attitudes and understanding. This is about developing the doctors, the nurses, the allied health professionals, the paramedics of the future, to have a different idea about dementia than the one that we have. 
So it's a three-year program, £780,000. Just learned yesterday that we've got this money, so it's great. It will happen. It's funded by HEX. It's a collaboration, and this is really important. I mean, this medical school is good at collaboration because it is a collaboration, as we've heard, between the two universities, between various, various mental health and acute health trusts. It doesn't work without collaboration. Dementia research doesn't work without collaboration either. So we're collaborating with the Alzheimer's Society who will recruit 300 families so that our, our new intake in 2014 uh, will, in their second term, meet a family with dementia uh, in pairs and will follow that family through for three years of their medical training. And they will get to understand what it is to have a long-term condition like dementia. They'll learn about dementia, but it's also a way of changing, of developing, of improving, whatever you want to say, people's compassion, their attitudes towards patients, they will understand what it is to be old and ill in our systems. And we will deliver that in our medical school and in the University of Surrey School of Nursing. Uh, we've got a, a high quality development plan with this, uh, the thing that we're doing with, that I'm doing with, uh, it's, uh, it's led by us in BSMS, uh, in um, HACC. And Juliet Wright are collaborating on this, and Wendy Grosvenor over in Surrey, uh, and, uh, and Chris Wells from the uh, Alzheimer's Society. And essentially, together, we will build this program. We will evaluate this program. It will give our students a unique experience. And this is world-leading stuff that we are doing here, that because we're you know, <coughs> agile and able to do this, we can do this where other people couldn't. So that's something we will deliver to change professional attitudes and understanding. So that's a reason to be cheerful, I think. Reason to be cheerful, part two. Our second part focuses on better diagnosis of dementia. Now the problem is that most people who've got dementia don't know they've got dementia and never know they've got dementia. Only 44% of people with dementia at the moment ever get a diagnosis. And that needs to change. Because when they do, it's late in the illness, often at a time of stress, often at a time of crisis when people go into a general hospital. Uh, when it's too late to prevent harm, it's too late to prevent crises. And that's really important because that preventative agenda is there in dementia. Yes, we need to think about preventing the illness happening in the first place. But we also need to think about preventing the harms that accrue to individuals. And we can do that. There are already things that we know we can do, like the information that stops people from going into care homes, for example. We can change things. Our goal must be 70 or 80% of people with dementia diagnosed, and when they're diagnosed, receiving it earlier rather than later, so that they can make their own choices. Diagnosis, in and of itself, as long as it is made well, so it's accurate, as long as it is communicated well so that people can use that information, as long as people get the information and support they need at the time of diagnosis, is a good in and of itself for people with dementia. And it's one that we deny the majority of people with dementia at the moment. There's a lot of talk about what timely means. Timely diagnosis, for me, is responding when people have problems. It's not about population screening. There's absolutely no reason or rationale for doing that. People would like to do it, and there's a world of research. It's about earlier diagnosis but it's not the world of intervention. It's about bringing people from this late stage diagnosis and most people not being diagnosed through to this timely diagnosis. That's what our strategy is about. That's what all sensible national strategy is about. And we can do it. <coughs> These are data from the uh, development and evaluation of the Croydon Memory Service Model, which I was involved in uh, in my last job. And what we showed is that it's perfectly possible to generate services that work really well, that actually work for the whole population, not just the lucky few, that actually are complementary to existing services, and that do those three things. They make the diagnosis well, they communicate it well, and they provide immediate care and support. And these services have high acceptability, low levels of inappropriate referral. They work for minority ethnic groups and people of all ages. They improve quality of life. They decrease behavioral disorder. They lift us up from seeing 15% of people early to about 70%. We can do this. They're clinically effective. 
They're also cost effective if we were able to, this is modelling that we carried out with and for the Department of Health, and what this shows is if we prevent 10% of admissions to care homes, and you know, care homes are necessary. There are brilliant care homes out there doing fantastic work, and some individuals are much, much better off being in a care home than being in their own home. Just not everybody that goes into care homes. And if we prevent just 10% of those admissions, we break even in terms of generating a national network of these services. And in 20%, we start giving money back into the system to be able to improve care and to deal with rising demand. One of the questions that gets raised is how we tell whether the services that we provide actually help the people that we wish to Help. So a service is very unlikely to improve someone's cognitive state. It's not going to make your memory any better. But does it improve your life? We know that there are things that we can do that sometimes have a bad effect. So if you have a person with dementia who perhaps has a behavioural problem, so they're perhaps a little anxious and they're asking the same question over again, and the, you know, their, their wife is concerned, and so you go to the doctor and they give the person an antipsychotic. If you were to measure the symptom before and after, the symptom may well have gone down. But has the patient's quality of life improved? Almost certainly not. It's almost certain that they're sort of sitting in the corner and they're stiff and they're not talking and the wife will feel, you know, what's happened to this person? They're not in the room anymore because of the drug. So we've cured the symptom. You know, the operation was successful, but the patient <coughs> has died. And that's why... In illnesses like dementia that are complicated, we need not only these fine measures of individual function, but also broad measures of the overall effect of what we do. And part of my research uh, has been to develop such measures. So here we have two monographs from the HGA that are from two programs that we carried out, first to develop the system, the DemQual system, and then to carry out utility weighting so that it can be used for economic as well as uh, clinical investigation. And using it on the Croydon Memory Service model that we've seen here, what you see is that people who receive the service, their quality of life improves at six months and stays improved at 12 months. These are effect sizes that are double the effect size of anti-dementia medication. Okay? Our services do good for people. People are concerned that if you give people a diagnosis, maybe they'll get you know, worried. It's not good news being told you've got dementia. But it's not good news having dementia either. Ignoring it doesn't make it go away. What those data suggest is that if you do it properly, and if you do it well, then people's quality of life improves. And that's important. But if we can measure quality of life, we can also start to investigate what it is that drives quality of life for people with dementia. And, I, and this is a study that we carried out that shows... You know, absolutely counterintuitive findings. So, the mini mental state examination, MMS E up here, that is a very commonly used measure of cognition, of memory, of your ability, your brain abilities. And we can measure that very well, and it's often used as the, the central thing that happens in dementia. What this shows, the smaller the number, the smaller the association, is that mini mental state scores, so cognition, has no effect on quality of life for the person with dementia. The, the, the BI that we have there, the ADL score, that's activities of daily living. Again, something that we very commonly measure as our prime outcome in dementia. The uh, people's ability to do things for themselves, to, 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 to dress themselves, to eat, those sorts of things. And what we see here is that acti activities of daily living have absolutely no effect on quality of life. They just don't matter in quality of life terms. We'll come back to this. I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting finding. But what we do find is that a whole variety of things that are to do with agitation, anxiety, disinhibition, irritability, that's what drives poor quality of life for people with dementia. Here we have some multivariate analyses which take the same thing. And what they show is the same thing that MPI, so that's behavioral disturbance, powerful driver of quality of life, mini mental state, activities of daily living, trivial. What we also find is that patient age is associated. So people who develop their dementia younger have worse quality of life 
than older people who develop that dementia. And that may well be societally generated, things to do with expectations, things to do with experiences, for example. So we can use these measures, these broad measures of outcome, to tell us something useful about how we develop services. And so here we see the same thing. What we see here, this quality of life up here, uh, there's minimal, mild, moderate, and severe dementia here. What we see, and this is, uh, this is a great slide. That's my favorite slide of them all. Feel the anticipation building on that. <laughs> what this shows is that it's perfectly possible <coughs> to have good quality of life at any stage of dementia. And isn't that a relief? Because it's a degenerative disease. And we can't stop the degeneration. If it were the case that our quality of life necessarily deteriorated as cognition deteriorates, that would be appalling. But that's not what this shows. This shows that people at any stage of dementia can live well. And that says something about the transcendence of humans our ability to adapt even to appalling circumstances. And we know that's true. Our ability to find ways that work. Again, many of the things that we'll see there are people who, families, who found ways of interacting that focus on what people can still do rather than what they can't do. That focus on human interaction and touch and all sorts of stuff. And those of you who are lucky enough, privileged enough, who have worked with people with dementia, with severe dementia, with people in care homes with dementia who are severely disabled, will know that it's perfectly possible for people at the end of their lives with dementia to have great life quality and to have a meaningful interaction with their family. Of course, what this also shows is that it's perfectly possible to have a miserable quality of life at any stage of dementia. So it points out what we should do for our services. Our services are there to find people with dementia. Our services are there to find out what the quality of life of people with dementia are. And that's what we do as clinicians in the holistic assessments that we carry out. And then drive up the quality of life for those with poor life quality and maintain the quality of life and learn from those with good life quality so that others can benefit from that. And here we have uh, uh, more data, unpublished data, uh, on, again, the Croydon Memory Service Model, this time with several thousand patients showing... Uh, the improvement at one year maintained to two years, which is brilliant. It's just what we'd want. What it starts to show also is that if you see this green line here, that's people diagnosed with a moderate dementia, so later. And the blue line is people diagnosed with mild dementia, so earlier. And what this shows is that people who are diagnosed early do better. It's better to know early than to know late. What this shows here, the green line is for men, and the blue line is for women. And what that shows is that women do much worse than men. Seems a bit unfair, doesn't it? Why is that? Well, it's probably driven by the fact that this cohort of older people, men tended to marry women that were younger than them, and also that women tend to live longer than men. So what it means is that those people who are men are more likely to have a co-resident spouse carer in their house. And that that <coughs> carer, that spouse, enables the good work of the service to be expressed for those men. Whereas the women are much more likely to be alone. Which is the problem. And, you know, there's a conclusion one can draw from this, of course. Which is that if you're a woman and you're approaching your 50s, then it's probably a good idea to trade in your husband <laughs> for one about 15 years younger, then you should be all right. Just a tip. And diagnosis is changing. We are starting to change the numbers that are diagnosed. Yes, it's only 44%, but it's improving. This is data from the quality outcome framework registers that we have. But it's weird. Because there are people out there, sincere people, good people, some of them, um, who don't like the idea that we're focusing on dementia, 
who don't like the idea that we're diagnosing more people with dementia. And there's some perfectly good reasons for this. This is a paper from the BMJ's Bad Medicine, or Too Much Medicine uh, campaign uh, series. Actually, if you analyse what's going on here, a lot of it is about fighting other battles over the bodies of patients with dementia. So it's things that are about national diktats and quaffs and quips and all the rest of those uh, incentives that are out there. Yes, it's about concerns about the evidence base, but they're tiny concerns. And we have to make decisions on the basis of uncertainty. That's what we do as doctors, as nurses, as allied health professionals. And the language is remarkable. This paper includes the paragraph at the end, which talks about the curse of diagnosis. Which, which, which other disease would people feel able to use this sort of language about. And whose illness is it anyway? It's the people with dementias. Yeah. Is knowledge power for people with dementia? Yes, it is. Is ignorance bliss? No, it's not. It's not bliss for health services either. Because if you don't know, you can't manage the patient properly. And that's what causes all the problems in acute care, for example. And there are examples of good uh, consensus that are going on to try and break this uh, uh, to break these kind of cycles of, of disbelief and these cycles of inaction. But actually what we need is good quality evidence on some of these things. But even without that, what we see is that since the introduction of our national dementia strategy, what we have is an increase in the number of people who are being <coughs> diagnosed. So this is happening anyway. We need, this is happening in our system. We need to be able to deal with it. And there are simple things that we can do. Here's an example of some work that uh, we did here from Brighton and Sussex Medical School, uh, myself and Rita Flaherty, who's from uh, the Division of Medical Education here, ran a course for London that was about giving, those, giving GPs a deep understanding of the issues of dementia and also the leadership skills to be the next generation of leaders for dementia in primary care. And as part of this, we did it. We created... Uh, a way of recoding, of cleaning up the, um, uh, the, the primary care records and making them work better for dementia. And we ended up with an 8.8% increase after just four hours' work in the number of people that were on these registers. Now, that's important for the people with dementia because then they can be accurately identified and be given the right treatment. But this would be the equivalent to increasing your rank for your PCT um, by 70 places out of the 176 in the UK. This is a big change for just four hours' work. Little things that we can do that make a big difference. And this is another uh, uh, enterprise that we have going. This is the Diadem study. This is an IHR programme grant through, through to the second stage. It's going in on the 11th of March, a five-year, £2 million programme. Again, a collaboration with the Alzheimer's <laughs> Society. This is all about diagnosis of dementia. It's about working out what are the harms and the benefits of diagnosis versus not diagnosis. What are the harms versus the benefits of diagnosing early rather than late? Generating empirical evidence that enables that logjam that we talked about to be broken. So a five-year programme, collaboration with the Alzheimer's Society, with UCL, with Cambridge, with Manchester and Newcastle, led by us uh, in collaboration with the primary care department here and Helen Smith's department, who's a co-applicant on this, led by us, understanding these benefits. And again, world-leading and unique. This is stuff that we can do, stuff that we will do. So the last reasons to be cheerful. There are three of those. One, two, three. Reasons to be cheerful, part three. So better prevention and better treatment of dementia. So here we have um, a paper from The Lancet, end of last year, uh, from uh, Carol Brain, the CFAS studies, basically looking at uh, the differences over 20 years of two epidemiological studies. And here's a, 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 the editorial that I wrote to go alongside that. And what it shows, and this is brilliant, is that the age-specific prevalence of dementia is going down. So in a particular age group, our risk in this 20 years, 20 years ago was higher than it is now. And it's consistent across all these age groups. And what this shows, and you know, this shows that we can decrease the numbers of the, the risk of individuals developing dementia. And the, the thing that's happened here 
is all the brilliant work that's been done for heart disease and cancer. So it's all those lifestyle changes. It's stopping smoking. It's improving your diet. It's improving exercise. That's starting to have an impact. Now, it won't get rid of dementia. It won't stop the numbers rising because our population's aging. But it will slow things down. And at a population level, this is tremendously important and valuable. There is a two-edged sword here, of course. Things that we have done have decreased the prevalence. Things that we may do may increase it. So if we all start smoking again, or if, we, or if there is a, uh, an epidemic of obesity, which there is, if people don't exercise, then maybe it'll go the other way. But this is great news. It shows there's prevention. So some other possibilities of improvement. Antipsychotic drugs. This is a report that I carried out for the Department of Health. We identified that 1,800 deaths were attributable to antipsychotics being used for the treatment of behavioural disorders and dementia. Now, the problem about antipsychotics for behavioural disturbance and dementia is that they actually don't work very well at all. But they do have side effects, and they have side effects that are specific to dementia. So these are deaths that would not have happened had these individuals not been given this drug and had they not had dementia. So 1,800 deaths. So what to do? Well, you know, there's a, a set of system things that one might do using clinical government systems. The media was able to latch on to this because it's a simple thing. In a complex world, we found a simple marker of good and bad quality here. And that led the care service minister at the time, the last one, Paul Burstow, uh, to say, we'll sort this out. We will use not new money, but the existing resources of the Department of Health, which are there, the existing clinical governance structures that exist in primary care and in other places, to address this. This is something that we want to change, and it's changed. We've half the numbers of people who are on these drugs since 2009. And with that, we've saved 900 lives per year. So things have changed. Let's look again at that acute side of things. 70% of people <coughs> in general hospitals are old. Old people are who go to hospitals now. Dementia is common. So up to half of those people may have dementia, because dementia complicates everything. So it makes it more likely that the really great community things that we put in place don't work. So dementia predicts admission. It's also a prediction of all the bad things that can possibly happen in hospital, from mortality to increased stay length to readmission, all of those things. But this is the bit that really gets me. It appears that 30% of people who go into a general hospital with a dementia from their own home go out to a care home. And some people admit that that's on every occasion that you're admitted there is that chance. That means that general hospitals are, 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 are machines for institutionalising people. And of course, some of those people need to go in. For some people, it's absolutely the right thing. But for all of them, for 30% of people, and it's so inefficient, because it costs so much to put these people into care homes. It, you know, it, the, the, a third of that money is borne by families themselves, more like a half here in Sussex, in fact. And two-thirds is borne by the, uh, uh, by the exchequer. So we have a complex world. If we look at dementia, comorbidity, multiple morbidity, is the rule, not the exception. So in dementia, only 17% of people with dementia only have dementia. High levels of comorbidity <coughs> with physical illness and mental disorder. If we look at hospitals, we've said this before, but essentially it's old people that are in hospitals, and it's old people that bad things happen to. This is data from the US Health and Retirement Survey. It shows that those with cognitive impairment have the highest level of comorbidity, <coughs> with about a half having two or more major impactful health conditions, and 20% having three or more. And there's things we can do. This is data, the RAID model from, uh, from Birmingham, which shows that taking a general hospital and making it a place that owns dementia. Saying that it's our business rather than someone else's business. Saying that it's in our interest to do this well, because it's good for our patients and it's good for us. So reducing stay length, increasing discharge at accident emergency departments, more home discharges, reducing admissions, readmissions, 
make, saving four pounds for every pound that's spent, doing all the things that make for a good quality service. It makes sense for people to do dementia well. If we do dementia well, we can get other things right. Multimorbidity is common in dementia, and it's a complex phenomenon. I'll say something about depression as a comorbidity. Depression is common in dementia. 20% of people at any one stage have dementia, have de with dementia have depression. It causes high distress, low quality of life, problems for carers as well as the person with dementia. It's a bad thing to have. This is a study that we carried out, the HTA SAD study published in The Lancet in 2011. And what this shows is that what works for people without dementia, these drugs, so sertraline and lamotazepine, uh, were compared with placebo. Sertraline and lamotazepine are two great drugs to treat depression. They treat depression well in people of all ages. They treat depression well in older people. They don't treat people well who have depression in dementia. Here, there's no advantage of taking uh, sertraline compared to placebo or lamotazepine compared to placebo. So essentially, oh, sorry, there is a difference, but it's that you get more side effects. So there are twice the number of adverse effects if you take the antidepressants, but no effects. And what that means is that it's different in dementia, and that's important, because that's an exemplar of the fact that what works in simple conditions may not work in complex conditions. Depression is different in dementia. There's a read across to all sorts of illnesses. So what's the use of antidepressants? They're different in dementia. You've seen that the side effects, the <coughs> adverse effects, the mortality is different in dementia with antipsychotics compared to people who do not have dementia. We've seen that the effects are different for people with depression and dementia in that the antidepressants don't work anything like as well. So differences in effects and harms. You need to be very careful in generalising findings from non-demented populations to people with dementia in terms of both effects and harms. But that would be the same as for generalising findings from, from simple populations <coughs> to complex populations. Multimorbidity is all about complexity and different rules apply. This is my one equation here. This is the one thing that you can perhaps take away with you here. Because this is about all illness. This is about the real illness that's in our general hospitals. We don't have people with a single funny thing going on with them anymore. So you've got somebody with condition A and condition B and condition C, and you're interested in what the treatment for that individual is. It's very unlikely to be a straight treatment A, treatment B, plus treatment C, but the services that we've generated over the past 20 years have kind of become increasingly specialised. So you get people who are really brilliant at treating one organ or one bit. The trouble is the patients that come in They've got more than one thing going on. And it may be that the treatment of A plus B plus C is you know, A plus C, but not B, or A plus half of B. We don't have the evidence. We don't do trials on these groups. And so we don't know what to do. I'm getting to the end. So, Dr. McCoy and Spock. And what do we have here? A game of chess, yes? but not as we know it. This is three-dimensional. <laughs> Dr. McCoy, the doctor, he's really good at chess, but he's really good at two-dimensional chess. Spock <coughs> knows three-dimensional chess because he's very clever. McCoy plays Scott at three-dimensional chess. What happens if he plays three-dimensional chess using the rules of two-dimensional chess? Does he win? <laughs> Does he lose? He loses. He loses. But that's what we do every day. <coughs> when we use the rules that we've learnt from single discrete illnesses, from efficacy studies that exclude the vast majority of people who may be affected who are old with complex problems, when we use that evidence to treat people, we are using the rules of two-dimensional chess to play three-dimensional chess. And yes, we as clinicians lose, but it's our patients <coughs> that really lose when we do that. So here's a trial that we're about to put in that is a real effectiveness, sti effectiveness study. It's been fast-tracked. We'll see what happens. But again, it's something that we can lead with because we've got the people out there. We've got the expertise. We can do world-leading, unique work.
And there's a need to do this. Here we have Standard & Poor's, a credit rating agency. Not something that you often see in medical lectures. But what they're saying is that the biggest medium-term risk for health services, but actually for governments as a whole in the developed world, are the long-term costs of care, are caring for an ageing population. That's what will break the bank. 50% of that is probably attributable to dementia. And all of it's about complexity. So what is this? It's a slide. This is a picture of the Great Wall of China from space. You can see the Great Wall of China from space. Dementia is so big that you can see it from space. <laughs> Here we have an S-shaped curve. Here we have 1979 to 2049. Here we have us with dementia at the moment. We need small investment for a high yield. Look at the, other, at the top there. If we look at cancer and heart disease, that's just what you were doing in cancer and heart disease in the 80s and 90s. Doing great work, spending a bit, and getting a lot back. But where we are now with those sorts of things is that you have high investment for a marginal yield, a small amount. Now, if we live in a time of constraint, and we live in a time of constraint, in 2014, we have to make choices. So do you choose to invest in dementia, where you get a high yield for a low investment? Or do you choose to carry on with what's easy, with what we've done for ages, which has a low yield for a high investment? So you come to the end. You know, it's brilliant, I think, what we have achieved so far. But there is so much more to do. Things really have moved on. It is much better to live with dementia now than it was 10 years ago, 25 years ago. There has never been a better time to live with dementia, but it's still an awful time to live with dementia. There's a gigantic amount that we can and must do. We need to make the weather in dementia. It was a point to the clouds, promise. We need to make the weather in dementia, and we can do it. We can do it because we're small here. We can be agile, so we can do things like uh, the Time Enough for Dementia program that other medical schools never could do. Because we're a partnership, because we're used to partnership working, we can do complicated things like dementia, not just hyper-specialised single things. And that's really important. And it's brilliant that we're young, because we can innovate. Because the solutions of yesterday won't work for the problems of today and the problems of tomorrow. Dementia is a brilliant exemplar of the problems of today and the problems of tomorrow. So that's what we need to do. So thank you very much uh, for listening.